Hello class, here we are again, continuing our introduction to the kidney, and we're going to spend most of our time talking about um, filtration. And uh, I talked actually talked about clearance in the last presentation, but here we go. Glomerular filtration is the process of, of filtering plasma through the glomerulus and into Bowman's capsule. Things that end up in Bowman's capsule is mostly based on, based on size. That's a process called molecular sieving. Uh, sieve is like a colander or a strainer. What we're going to find is that, that materials have to go through three layers. There are the holes in the fenestrated capillaries of the glomerulus. There are negative charges in the basement membrane. And then there are slits in the podocytes of Bowman's capsule. There are uh, forces that encourage fluid to go through the glomerulus. Those are determined by the Starling's forces. We introduced these concepts um, last semester when we talked about uh, uh, the cardiovascular system. We also talked about filtration at pulmonary capillaries, how that can contribute to uh, pulmonary edema. We're going to think about those Starling's forces again and, um, and how that results in glomerular filtration. And a big influence of the Starling's forces and filtration um, is the resistance or the, the radius of the uh, afferent arterial. So here's a picture from your textbook. Here we see the glomerulus. This is the um, afferent arterial. These are the 20 so uh, capillaries of the glomerulus. Actually, they are covered by cells of Bowman's capsule called podocytes. Then there's a little space. The fluid goes into the space and then it makes its way down the proximal tubule. Um, plasma that was not filtered then continues on through the capillaries and leaves through the efferent arterial. Notice we see a piece of the um, distal convoluted tubule and some other cells. Uh, this is a structure that we call the juxtaglomerular apparatus. These are some cells that are going to make a substance called renin, but we'll get back to that at another time. Now notice this box here. Uh, so our authors have blown up this box, and now we have this picture here. So what we see is the first layer between the plasma and Bowman's capsule are the fenestrated endothelium. So the capillaries in the glomerulus have little holes in them, and things can go through the holes. Then there's a basement membrane that has some, some negative charges that repel proteins. And then there are little sits slits in the podocytes, and uh, substances can kind of make their way through those slits. Um, so uh, the podocytes have these arms, and they're kind of fringy, and they kind of intersect. And so, so there's kind of a, an obstacle course that things have to go through to travel from the plasma to the filtrate. So here's a picture from another textbook. So we have endothelial cells and spaces and holes in the endothelial cells. Then we have these negative charges in the basement membrane. And then we have slits in the podocytes. So a sodium ion or a chloride ion would have to go through the spaces, go through the matrix, and then go through the slits. Some big gigantic thing like a red blood cell or an albumin molecule is not going to be able to get through that. They're going to, it's going to be uh, kept into the plasma. So things that can go through, we talk about being freely filtered, um, and then things that have to stay in the plasma are not filtered. Here's an electron micrograph from your textbook showing here's a little window or a little um, fenestration in the endothelium. There's your basement membrane and the slits of the podocytes. If you're very small, and I mean by that under 500, whoops, I'm having trouble writing, um, uh, 5,500 kilodaltons, I'm having trouble with my uh, little presentation here, 5,500 kilodaltons, um, uh, you are small enough to get through this membrane. 
Uh, so that that that's chloride, that's bicarbonate, that's magnesium, that's phosphate, that's glucose, that's urea, that's creatinine, that's most drugs. Um, things can go right through there. But if you're a large protein like myoglobin or hemoglobin or albumin or immunoglobulin, if you're a cell like a white blood cell or a red blood cell, um, you are not going to get through that layer. Uh, if you're an estrogen molecule and you're unbound, you can get through. If you're an estrogen molecule but you're attached to sex-binding globulin, then you're not going to be filtered. So essentially, if something is freely filtered, the concentration of that substance in the plasma should be equal to the concentration in the filtrate. So something like water with a molecular weight of 18 is smaller than the little spaces, so the ratio of filtrate to plasma is one to one. So water is freely filtered. Glucose has a molecular weight of one of uh, 180. Uh, glucose, you know, so if your plasma has 70 milligrams percent, your filtrate's going to have 70 milligrams percent. So one to one, freely filtered. Inulin is a um, soluble fiber. Uh, found in the Jerusalem artichoke or in chicory root. Uh, its molecular weight is 5,000, and it is freely filtered. And how do we know that? Because we have a one-to-one -one relationship between the filtrate and the plasma. Now, myoglobin is a muscle protein, 17 uh, kilodaltons. Some myoglobin can get through, but not all of it. So myoglobin is only partially filtered. Hemoglobin, 68 kilodaltons, uh, only on very, very rare occasions gets through. So uh, hemoglobin is not filtered much at all. Albumin, even less. So um, it's a good thing. You don't want to spend a lot of energy making proteins and have them filtering out into the into the uh, filtrate so they go out in the urine. You want to hang on to those. So we typically do not filter proteins. But on occasion, a protein will get, get out every once in a while. If there's something wrong with your glomer glomerular filtration membrane and proteins are getting through, those proteins end up in the urine. That's called proteinuria. That's not a good sign. That's an indication of disease. So here's a diagram indicating some of the Starling's forces. Now here's an afferent arterial. This is bringing the blood in. There's the glomerulus, and then the efferent arterial. Now I've drawn this very specifically to show you that the afferent arterial is larger than the efferent arterial. The efferent arterial, because the outflow is a little smaller, it exerts some back pressure. And that back pressure ends up elevating glomerular hydrostatic pressure. So hydrostatic pressure from the glomerulus into Bowman's capsule is quite high. Uh, it can be between 45 and 60 millimeters of mercury, which is a lot higher than, than hydrostatic pressures you've seen in other capillary beds. Um, there are, there's protein, there's albumin that's holding uh, liquid in the capillary. So that's our um, protein osmotic pressure or our oncotic pressure. And then um, there's a hydrostatic pressure in Bowman's capsule that pushes back into the capillary. Now notice I've only shown three forces here. I, have, I don't have four Starling's forces. Notice I'm not showing um, an oncotic pressure in Bowman's capsule. And that is because, and that's because this should be zero. So we usually don't show it. We don't expect a bunch of protein in Bowman's capsule. So we only list the three proteins. This is a picture from your textbook, again, showing you that hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus is pushing fluid into Bowman's capsule. Oncotic pressure is holding fluid in the capillary. Hydrostatic pressure in Bowman's capsule is pushing back in this direction. Um, and so according to Vander, if you're... Um, Glomerular uh, hydrostatic pressure is 60. Bowman's hydrostatic pressure is 15. Um, 
protein osmotic is 29, you add that up and we have a filtration force of 16 going from the capillary to Bowman space. Now this is a picture from uh, Rhodes and Tanner showing you the difference between a particular skeletal muscle capillary. So at the arterial end of a capillary, you've got lots of filtration. But hydrostatic pressure decreases across the capillary. So somewhere in the middle you get balance. And then as you go towards the venous end, you have more absorption. So we talked about that under the, under the cardiovascular section, that on the arterial side you filter, on the venous side you absorb, you'd like to be in balance, any little uh, leftover filtration goes into the lymphatics. Notice in the glomerulus we don't really have any reabsorption. What we have is all filtration. So um, uh, hyd uh, hydrostatic pressure stays fairly constant, um, as we remove fluid and albumin gets co concentrated, our oncotic pressure goes up a little bit. Really, by the time we enter the efferent arterial, uh, filtration should be close to zero. It doesn't really show it in this picture, but, but um, uh, the glomerulus is a completely filtering capillary. So... In a way, Mother Nature has divided a, a typical capillary bed in half. And the filtering side of the capillary bed is in the glomerulus, and what we're going to find is the absorbing part of the capillary bed is in the peritubular capillaries. So it's that afferent arterial that really regulates the GFR. You see, if you constrict the afferent arterial, then you have less blood coming into the glomerulus. Glomerular hydrostatic pressure decreases, and therefore the GFR decreases. Likewise, if you dilate the afferent arterial, you have more blood coming into the glomerulus. Hydrostatic pressure goes up, and you increase the GFR. Now, theoretically, we can talk about constricting the efferent that increases the back pressure and increases the GFR. Or we can dilate the efferent arterial. We decrease the back pressure and that decreases the GFR. But really, physiologically, we're mostly talking about A and, A and D. We're mostly talking about, and I'm not going to say that we never regulate the efferent arterial. I'm just saying it makes much more sense to concentrate our efforts on talking about the afferent arterial. So how does this work? Well, let's say we have too much plasma. Maybe we've, we've been drinking a lot, we ate a lot of salt, whatever, and we've increased our blood volume. That stretches the atria. And the atria are responsible for producing something called atrial natriuretic peptide. Atrial natriuretic peptide is a hormone that goes to the kidney. It inhibits aldosterone. We have not talked about what aldosterone does yet, but it inhibits aldosterone, but it also has effects on the kidneys. It dilates the afferent arterial. May do some constriction of the efferent, but more importantly, we're dilating the afferent arterial, which increases the GFR. We also decrease our reabsorption of sodium. So we filter more, we reabsorb less sodium, and we have fluid and sodium going out in the urine. That would help return our plasma volume back to where it should be. We also could have a situation where we're dehydrated and we don't have enough plasma. Maybe we had a terrible case of food poisoning and uh, it, we've had some, um, had some diarrhea and become um, uh, dehydrated and... Um, uh, hypovolemic. So what we're going to try to do is decrease filtration and hang on to sodium. So we've had a lot of sodium and water loss due to, to uh, diarrhea. That decreases the plasma volume, decreases our venous pressure. We have less venous return, less atrial pressure, um, decreased uh, preload, decreased stroke volume, decreased cardiac output, decreased blood pressure. Uh, our baroreceptors are going to say, holy Toledo, um, 
Uh, we have less plasma volume. There's some other other kind of bare receptor type things. Um, anyway, if our blood pressure is too low, we're going to activate the sympathetics. So there's a branch. Um, the the renal nerve contain, contains uh, sympathetic um, efferents and afferents, but those efferents are going to go to the kidney and tell the afferent arterial to constrict. We are going to reduce glomerular filtration pressure and reduce the GFR. Now you might be saying, but Dr. A, if our GFR is too low, we're not cleaning our blood. You're right. However, if we don't have blood pressure, we're not alive. So we constrict the afferent arterial, we decrease the GFR, we try to hang on to sodium and water till we can drink, till we can replace that fluid, and then we can go back to cleaning the blood. So sometimes some aspects of homeostasis take precedent over others, and maintaining blood pressure is always an important thing to do. It, it often um, supersedes other things we need to do, like cleaning the plasma. So there are lots of things that will regulate the GFR, uh, the tone of the arterial. So if we dilate the afferent arterial, we can, we're going to increase the GFR. If we constrict the afferent arterial, we're going to decrease the GFR. If we produce atrial natriuretic peptide in response to volume overload, we're going to increase the GFR. If we have low blood pressure or low blood volume, we are going to decrease the GFR. There are some uh, support cells in the glomerulus called mesangial cells, and when we constrict them, we decrease the permeability of the capillary bed, and that decreases the GFR. Uh, if we stimulate the sympathetics, we decrease the GFR. And, and, and so we're maintaining blood pressure until we can um, get some more fluid on board. Angiotensin II is a vasoconstrictor. It's going to constrict the afferent arterial and decrease the GFR. We also have an intrinsic mechanism in, in addition to um, autoregulation called tubuloglomerular feedback. Now, so tubuloglomerular feedback is going to require this juxtaglomerular apparatus. And I want to call your attention to these cells, either at the end of the loop of Henle or the beginning of the distal tubule. And these specialized cells are called the macula densa. And the macula densa is a chemoreceptor. And it can sense the amount of electrolytes. Now I have concentration here, and I really I really shouldn't have that word there. I really should have load, which is more of an amount. Pardon my writing with my little uh, mouse here. So um, it's a chemoreceptor. And notice it's sitting right next to the afferent arterial. So things going on in the distal tubule can be communicated to the afferent arterial to regulate the GFR. And so here's how it works. If we have an increase in blood pressure and we increase the GFR and we have much more filtration, by the time we get to the macula densa, we're going to have an increased delivery of sodium chloride. And the macula densa basically talks to the afferent arterial and asks it to constrict. And it basically says, you are sending more sodium chloride than I can handle. So I need you to constrict so we can, regu we can regulate this glomerular filtration pressure. Likewise, if arterial blood pressure goes down, then glomerular capillary pressure goes down and filtration goes down. Delivery of sodium to the macula densa is going to go down. And what's going to happen? We're going to dilate. Because the macula densa is going to say, the GFR is not high enough. You guys aren't cleaning the blood. You guys aren't sending me enough sodium. And that will increase glomerular flow and increase the GFR. 
Now, this is an intrinsic mechanism, all others equal. But if you have wicked, wicked low blood pressure, um, uh, really low blood pressure will, will overwhelm autoregulation and tubuloglomerular feedback because regulating the blood pressure ends up being more important than regulating the GFR. So in short, intrinsic mechanisms are about maintaining the GFR. We need to maintain the GFR because if we filter too much, we're not going to be able to maintain blood pressure. If we don't filter enough, we're not cleaning our blood. But intrinsic mechanisms can be overridden by extrinsic mechanisms like sympathetic stimulation or angiotensin II because if you don't have blood pressure, you don't have anything. So sometimes cleaning the blood will be put on the back burner because the emergent issue is the regulation of the blood pressure. So here we are in words, the macula densa can influence the GFR when you have too much filtrate, too much sodium chloride arriving at the macula densa. The response is to constrict the afferent arterial and decrease the GFR. The reverse is also true when there's not enough filtrate, not enough sodium chloride is arriving at the macula densa. The response is to dilate the afferent arterial and increase the GFR. This mechanism is to regulate the GFR and can be overridden by other mechanisms that maintain the blood pressure. All right. I'm not going to talk about this a lot in the presentation. We're going to talk about this in class, but I need to introduce some concepts that you will need to do the renal calculations. These are a part of your uh, homework grade, and these are problems that we will work on in class. First of all, I need you to realize that a flow is measured in mils per minute, and there are a number of flows in the body. There's the cardiac output, the flow going out of the heart. There's the renal blood flow, the blood flow going into the kidney. There's the part of the renal blood flow that's the plasma. So renal blood flow times 1 minus the hematocrit. So for example, if your renal blood flow is a liter a minute, and your hematocrit is 40, then 60% of your, of your blood is plasma. Uh, one liter times 0.6 gives you a renal plasma flow of 600 mils per minute. About 20% of your renal plasma flow is filtered, so 20% of 600 is 120 mils per minute. And your urine flow is our final flow, and it's about 1 to 2 mils per minute. Remember, we start with a 24-hour collection, and then we work back to mils per minute. We can also measure concentration. Concentrations are measured in milligrams per mil, or uh, sometimes moles per liter, but we're, a lot of what we're going to do is in milligrams per mil. Milligrams per 100 mils of blood, or milligrams per deciliter, is a milligram percent. So we can measure plasma concentration, and at Bowman's capsule, we assume plasma concentration and Bowman's capsule concentration for freely filtered things are the same. I just can't put an electrode in, in Bowman's capsule and figure out what concentration things are. But if I know it's freely filtered, then I know the plasma uh, filtrate concentration should be one to one. So I assume they're the same. And then I can measure urine concentration in milligrams per, per uh, mil or milligrams per cent. Now, here's the deal. A concentration tells you nothing. What you really need is a load or an amount. And a load is always calculated as the product of a flow times a concentration and is measured in milligrams per minute. So what's the amount of stuff in the plasma? That's the plasma load. What's the plasma flow? The renal plasma flow. What's the plasma concentration? the plasma concentration. So if I take renal plasma flow times plasma concentration, I can say this is the amount of PAH or the amount of glucose or the amount of sodium in the plasma. Filtered load. Well, the filtered load is the product of the glomerular filtration rate times the plasma concentration. Remember, we don't know the filtrate concentration. 
but we're assuming it's the same as the plasma concentration. So GFR times plasma concentration tells me the amount of PAH or the amount of inulin or the amount of magnesium or the amount of penicillin, whatever it is, in Bowman's capsule. Excreted load is what's the amount of stuff in the urine. And I take the urine flow times the urine concentration. So if I want to compare what's going on in the plasma versus what's going on in the urine versus what's going on in, in Bowman's capsule, I can't merely compare concentrations. I have to compare loads. Alrighty. So glomerular filtration rate. How are we going to measure that? Well, if we have a substance, and an example here we have is inulin, if that is freely filtered, not secreted, and not reabsorbed, then the plasma load is equal to the excreted load. And I just said that wrong. Dag on it. If inulin is freely filtered, not secreted, and not reabsorbed, then the filtered load, that's what I should have said, the filtered load is equal to the excreted load. Qualitatively, another way to say that is if the only way I get rid of a substance is through filtration, then the clearance of that substance is going to tell me the filtration rate. So, we have some, a, a substance called inulin. It's a soluble uh, fiber found in chicory root or in the Jerusalem artichoke. It's freely filtered. It goes into Bowman's capsule, and we concentrate it, but we don't add to it through secretion, and we don't take away from it through reabsorption. So the amount of inulin in Bowman's capsule is equal to the amount of inulin in the urine. Therefore, the filtered load is equal to the excreted load. And here's the filtered load and the excreted load. Here's another way to say it. This is a picture from Rhodes and Tanner. So here's my filtration process. Here's my excretion process. My filtered load, which is the plasma concentration of inulin times the GFR, is equal to the excreted load, which is the urine concentration of inulin times the urine flow. Well, I do a 24-hour urine collection, and I get this. And I take a urine sample, and I send it to the lab. And I take a plasma sample, and I send it to the lab. And I solve for GFR. And notice, urine flow times urine concentration divided by plasma concentration, that's the clearance formula. So this tells me that the clearance of inulin is equal to the GFR. Now, in your textbook, Vander, it talks about the clearance of inulin, and that's all good and true. However, in the hospital and most clinics, we don't measure the clearance of inulin. The assay is kind of weird, and, and you have to infuse the inulin. So why not use a substance that's already there and is a pretty good proximity? So we measure glomerular filtration rate with the clearance of creatinine. Creatinine is an endogenous substance, and if we assume the production of creatinine is pretty uh, constant, we can use that to measure the GFR. Creatinine is freely filtered, not reabsorbed, and just slightly secreted. So in some cases, it might overestimate the GFR in a little bit, but it's a really, really good measure. So when you look at lab reports, it's going to say the clearance of creatinine. If the endogenous production of creatinine is constant, now creatinine, this comes from muscle metabolism, 
So, you know, we're assuming somebody in the hospital, it didn't just jump up and run a marathon. So we're, we're assuming their plasma or their endogenous production is constant. And then we do a baseline GFR. Then after that, we can use plasma creatinine as a proxy measure of renal function. So one milligram percent is the average value of creatinine for a 150-pound male. If plasma creatinine started going up, you'd, you'd, that you'd suspect that the kidney's not filtering and getting rid of creatinine, and that would say something about kidney function. So here's GFR on our x-axis. Here's plasma creatinine on our y-axis. If our plasma, if our endogenous production of creatinine is constant, as the plasma concentration of creatinine goes up, that tells me that my GFR is going down. Now notice, this is about 2, this is about 1. Notice, plasma creatinine has gone from 1 to 2. But notice GFR has gone from 180 to 90. Now 180 is pretty high. This is probably a pretty big guy, a uh, pretty big young guy. But uh, don't miss the, the, the relationship. If your plasma creatinine doubles, your GFR has been cut in half. So very small changes in plasma creatinine can indicate a pretty significant loss of renal function. Now, there are other waste products that our kidneys get rid of. There's a blood urea nitrogen, or BUN. Uh, ammonia is, a, is the byproduct of um, deamination, but it's toxic, so your liver immediately converts that to urea. So you really, really, urea is the final product. Urea is freely filtered, slightly reabsorbed. Uh, clearance of, of urea underestimates the GFR a little tiny bit. And there are other reasons why BUN could increase. So if somebody goes on a protein diet, they're going to be deaminating a lot of amino acids. If they've had some muscle trauma, they're going to um, produce uh, urea. Um, cortisol breaks down proteins. And then renal failure also could be a reason why BUN goes up. Okay, so we have talked about um, the glomerular filtration rate, um, what regulates the glomerular filtration rate, how we measure the glomerular filtration rate, um, and uh, I'm going to end it here. Think about the questions you want to bring to class, and, um, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for working hard. Bye for now.